Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here and show some of our work. And thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, so I will talk about uh, low calorie sweeteners uh, and sweet taste. There's a lot of controversy about this, especially if you believe the, the media. And you can read headlines like this. You can find them quite easily. Uh, drinking diet soda makes you uh, can make you obese. It's very paradoxical. Uh, I think the main this started a few decades ago with a few studies that suggested that intake of uh, low calorie sweeteners would subsequently uh, drive overconsumption. Uh, and some reports are a bit more varied, but th there is a lot of controversy about this. Luckily, we also have a lot of data due to this. And so this is a uh, sort of the basic narrative that seems to be at the basis uh, of this idea that low calorie sweeteners uh, would trigger overconsumption and subsequently promote obesity. And this hinges on the cephalic phase release of insulin in anticipation of food intake. So the idea is that if you perceive sweet taste, it is a signal to your body that carbohydrate is coming in or glucose is coming in. And so your body prepares for that uh, by making a little bit of insulin already. Well, if you would then drink a, a soft drink, which has sweet taste due to an artificial sweetener, but no calories, then the idea is that your body would still make this little bit of insulin. Uh, this would cause a small decline in your blood glucose. And this might be one of the reasons that would trigger you into uh, eating. Now this is a simple and extremely attractive narrative. I think in every interview I have given about uh, low calorie sweeteners, usually it's about their effects on the brain, uh, we talk about this idea because people see it on the internet uh, and it sounds logical, doesn't it? Uh, and this is how this uh, blogger puts it. Uh, she says, when your pancreas produces insulin to deal with anticipated sugar, but then no sugar arrives, it's not just that you eat more, she claims it confuses your body and disrupts its metabolic process. <coughs> this is just a statement out of the blue with no reference whatsoever. Um, so let's have a look at some of the actual data on this. I will step back a little bit uh, now. So the cephalic phase insulin response is just part of a whole area of responses that prepare the body for digestion. And the idea behind this is that uh, eating is, is a threat to homeostasis. So there's a nice paper of Stephen Woods, which is called How We Tolerate Food. And that nicely points out the notion that eating is, is quite a thing for the body. It's, it's a big homeostatic challenge. And so in anticipation of food intake, it seems to be beneficial to prepare for that, to prepare for an optimal digestion. And this is the supposed role of cephalic phase responses. So even thinking about food can trigger these responses. For example, if you think about a lemon, you may start salivating already because of the sourness of the lemon. So your body is anticipating the acidity and is preparing for that. And a related idea related to satiety is that if you do this well efficiently or optimally, then you might be able to accommodate larger meals. And this is a review paper. Uh, it's a narrative review I wrote about 10 years ago. And I made a nice table looking at all the different responses. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but I think well, many of these cephalic phase responses have a clear function. So salivation, for example, is clearly beneficial for digestion. Or making gastric juice has a, has a clear function. But when we get to things like uh, insulin or pancreatic polypeptide, the function is a bit less clear and the data are also less clear. And this is usually harder to measure. And in particular, it's quite hard to show the actual benefit of these cephalic phase responses. Now here I, I sort of denoted, I have to use this one. Mm -hmm. 
I said yes to cephalic phase response. Um, but we shall see the data now because my PhD student recently completed a systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, partly because she failed to find cephalic phase insulin release herself. So we thought it was time also 10 years after this review to, well, to look at the available data uh, and see what is there. And I should say that in animals, uh, the findings are more consistent. For example, in mice, some people find very consistent cephalic phase responses. Um, but for humans, this remains to be uh, demonstrated. So this is uh, the outcome for uh, cephalic phase insulin release. Basically, she took all the studies in which people were exposed to food and where there was a measurement of uh, insulin or pancreatic polypeptide in the first 10 minutes uh, within this exposure. And what she found is that in about 40% uh, of the treatments, so the food exposure, one study can have multiple treatments, uh, there is an increase larger than one micro unit uh, of insulin. This is a definition coined by Karen Teff that this uh, well, is basically a kind of cutoff. So this would be classified then as a cephalic phase insulin release. Um, but if you look overall, then only 22% of these responses is actually a significant change from baseline. And you can see the different uh, effect sizes. This is uh, divided up into the different treatments that people receive. So sometimes it's just anticipating food intake, uh, rinsing the mouth or modified sham feeding, so chewing and spitting, uh, or actual intake in which we just look at uh, the, the earlier parts uh, of the hormonal response. And so overall, the median increase in insulin is 2.5 uh, units uh, around five minutes after the onset of this uh, food stimulation. And so this is a, a quite modest effect. And you can also plot it uh, like this. You see it a bit better in uh, time. So early on, there's not a lot happening. Uh, this is actual, this is the metabolic release of insulin. This, this large response is from the studies that have actual food intake. And you can appreciate the fact uh, that there are apparently one or two studies that did anticipation of food intake, but still found an increase uh, more than 20 minutes after this. So this is not likely to be true. Many of the very old studies uh, have some methodological issues, I think. And then let's look at the uh, pancreatic polypeptide. This is often seen as a, a marker for vagal stimulation. So people often uh, measure this as well to show that their uh, Q exposure was eff effective in eliciting <laughs> vagal stimulation. Uh, here the, the numbers are fairly similar. So of all the studies, uh, about 50% show the cephalic phase increase, uh, but only 23% of the studies had an increase that was significantly different from baseline. You can also see here that responses can be quite uh, variable, um, but overall the median increase is uh, about 100 units uh, picogram per milliliters from baseline uh, around nine minutes after the onset. This is the graph in time. Uh, so you can appreciate the very large variability here as well. And so this is actually contesting to this idea of the PP rises if you have sensory stimulation. So overall, only about half the studies observes uh, these cephalic phase responses, uh, of which only about a fifth is significantly different from baseline. And if you look at these studies, there, there is no consistent pattern. Uh, and arguably, there are 
differences between studies in many respects. Um, but if anything, there's variability in the magnitude and the onset of these responses. So there's variability all over. And the magnitude is quite small uh, compared to just fluctuations or your measurement error relative to the baseline. And this leads us to conclude that the physiological relevance of the cephalic phase insulin release and PP release is debatable because if it would have a very clear function, then <coughs> it would be more consistent. Uh, and the role in glucose homeostasis is not well supported. I think there's only one study that tried to figure this out. Um, but showing the actual benefit of having a cephalic phase insulin release is, is not so easy in, uh, in humans. Uh, and so this whole idea of a cephalic phase insulin response is not so robust. So this basically uh, tears down the whole argument that, uh, non, uh, that just sweetness alone without calories would mess up uh, satiety. Uh, but luckily there's, well, there's also data on that. This is, I think, the most recent uh, meta-analysis that's out there from Peter Rogers uh, and colleagues. And there are, there are several other papers. This is also a meta-analysis from Miller. And then a couple of, uh, of reviews that basically arrive at uh, very similar conclusions. Now, the first thing is actually the, the key idea that is, that is around, namely that in the short term, uh, uh, the consumption of a product with low calorie sweetness would trigger uh, overconsumption. And this is what they find. Uh, if anything, there is a, a low, well, this is first a sugar sweetened beverage, so then it makes sense that you ingest less energy because of the, the positive effect of the sugar. But also compared to water, uh, this, this effect is not significant. So uh, sweetener versus unsweetened versus water, nothing is happening. This effect is also not significant. So overall, there is no, there's no evidence that on the short term, people ingest more energy. Then if you look at the longer term, uh, so at weight loss, uh, then there are some effects. The effects are modest, but still, uh, well, it, it comes out basically. So these are adults. This is a study in the Netherlands in a large group of children who received uh, a sweetened uh, drink uh, at school. Uh, and they basically point in the same direction, namely that it will favor weight loss. Uh, it's not a huge effect in most studies, uh, but the effect is uh, significant. And uh, so this is what they uh, conclude. They also looked at uh, the animal literature, and there you also see no uh, effect towards overconsumption. And uh, so the complete evidence suggests that low energy sweeteners do not increase energy intake or body weight. And overall, uh, even you can say that the use of low energy sweeteners in, in place of sugar or sugar sweetened beverages is to reduce energy intake and uh, reductions in body weight potentially. And sort of supporting this is the idea that we don't really know the, the mechanisms by which low energy sweetness would lead to overconsumption and uh, changes in BMI. Uh, especially not given what I just showed you, uh, this simplistic narrative uh, doesn't hold, uh, and that's also outlined here. But also other mechanisms are not well supported. So that's a fairly uh, clear message, I would think, but still there is uh, some controversy, and so I will show some of that. Um, this is a headline that came from a study uh, from the lab of Dana Small, it's done by Marga Feldhuizen. And this is the headline, diet soda can really mess with your metabolism. So this is, again, this notion that low-calorie sweeteners might disrupt 
uh, metabolic regulation, whatever that may be. Uh, and well, this study has more to it, but this is one uh, thing I will pick out. So basically they find that this is about the degree of a mismatch or, or just the, the existence of a mismatch between the sweetness and the calories present in a drink. So in this study they have, it's a two by two design, they have drinks sweetened with sucralose uh, and they sweeten it uh, and then they add maltodextrin to it. So in these two conditions, uh, it's 75 uh, calories and 150. So then the sweetness is matched to the amount of calories. And in these two conditions, it's either too sweet for the calories that are in the drink or it is uh, less sweet than uh, you might expect based on the, the calories in the drink. And they then find that, uh, well, this is quite surprising, this is the energy expenditure after drinking, uh, assessed over 30 minutes. So that's the diet-induced thermogenesis, basically. And then they have the very counterintuitive finding that the lower calorie beverages, for example, uh, this beverage is, has, this beverage has fewer calories than the, this one, the 151, and there's a huge difference in this uh, energy expenditure. So you would not expect this to happen. It goes against well, most people's idea of what would be common sense. So I've encountered many people that just don't believe this. They just think it's physiologically impossible. And nevertheless, it remains to be uh, assessed. Uh, and so the basic idea is that if there is a mismatch between the sweetness and the caloric content, that then something <coughs> is, well, going wrong, or at least something is, is happening which is not what you would expect. Now, there is a lot of controversy about this, and so we uh, try to do a replication of this in collaboration uh, with these authors. Uh, and so this is the stimulus, uh, which I just briefly outlined, it's a maltodextrin for the calories, then there's sucralose for the sweetness, uh, and a, a unique flavor, a sort of uh, unfamiliar flavor to avoid any uh, conditioning effects. And people uh, ingest a drink like this. Oh. So we have this two by two design, so these are low energy, low sweetness, and high energy, high sweetness. So these are the matched conditions. And these are mismatched, so either uh, not sweet enough or too sweet. Uh, and in this replication study, the, the original study also had fMRI. Uh, we focused on the energy expenditure part, uh, but we added gastric emptying based on pilot results of the Yale group uh, to try and see if that would be driving uh, the energy expenditure effects through a difference in, uh, in absorption. So we had 15 participants and they either had uh, energy expenditure measured, so a 15 minute baseline and then 50 minutes, which is a bit longer than the original study. Uh, or on another day, they also received this drink, uh, and then we measure their stomach contents uh, over time uh, using MRI. So you can nicely see uh, how fast the drink is passing through the stomach and going into the intestine. <coughs> now this is what we found. Uh, so basically you see here, this is post-ingestion, this is the the change in energy expenditure and you see that for the higher energy drinks the change is larger um, what you might expect because there's more more energy in the drink so there's also more uh, energy metabolized uh, so that's also depicted here if you sum up this response so high energy has a stronger diet-induced thermogenesis than low-energy drinks. However, we still see an effect of the sweetness. So here you see 
there's a significant effect that oh this drink so this is the match one high energy high sweet if the drink is less sweet than you might expect based on the calories the energy expenditure is greater so it seems that the let's say the higher level of sweetness here is is delaying or suppressing this energy expenditure now luckily we have the stomach data to go with it uh, and these perfectly match these energy expenditure data or near perfectly so here we see the same so this was the drink uh, the matched one so this is the gastric emptying t50 so a higher t50 means this is slower emptying and remember this was the one uh, with a lower a lower energy expenditure change so that's in line with a slower emptying and this one had a higher change in energy expenditure and is emptying faster uh, and maybe i should mention also that this is actually the case of many soft drinks in which we have well maybe the energy the, in which a drink is sweeter than the, the actual caloric content so this might reflect uh, a diet drink and for this diet drink uh, we don't see any differences with the match condition we only see this for the higher energy dose and so this is just summarizing what i just said uh, so for the the drink that is too sweet this one which would reflect a, a diet drink which still contains some calories you see no uh, significant effect but here you see a difference due to the to the sweetness so we did confirm the basic notion that sweetness can modulate the metabolic response and that is mediated by the gastric emptying uh, and yeah i'm sorry for marga and uh, dana but i think our energy expenditure results are more physiologically well plausible i would say because well the ones they saw were are, are much harder to explain uh, so we see higher effect uh, at lower gastric emptying if you give more energy and then the question remains how can we explain the difference between the two studies and we had a lot of discussion about this obviously uh, at some point there was a journal that said well i want you to do another replication to arrive at a definitive answer because now there's there would be two sets of data that partly contradict each other so what now is true or how can you explain the difference well one thing that might be driving this is that although we matched a lot of <coughs> things very well we used the exact same drinks uh, is the type of maltodextrin I've been a bit naive about this. Uh, in the past, I would just buy a Fanto malt and thought <coughs> maltodextrin is maltodextrin. Uh, but actually, maltodextrin is, is very complex. So there are many different uh, compositions that you can buy. And so the chain length present in the maltodextrin, uh, and that differs. And there's also data from uh, John Glendinning, who does uh, my studies on the cephalic phase insulin response. And he, he showed at a conference and he also showed us his data that when he had to buy another maltodextrin brand uh, he saw a very different cephalic phase response in his mice uh, and also in his case the composition was different and we also measured it uh, our maltodextrin had more long chains than the the yield maltodextrin so we are now rerunning uh, the energy expenditure part of the study where we use the Yale maltodextrin and they use ours uh, to see if we then arrive at the same result or not and so this is quite exciting i hope we get a clear answer and not more confusion uh, but we shall see this remains to be uh, established 
Uh, then a last notion, uh, which was already alluded to uh, by Ian, and that is the fact that artificial sweeteners are often used as a sort of omnibus term, but these are very different compounds. So it makes perfect sense that they have different physiological effects because they're differently uh, metabolized. And this is a very nice recent study by Higgins and I think Mattes in the AGCN. And they did a fairly large trial in 123 overweight or obese uh, participants. So these are the ones that completed the trial. They had 150, I think. Uh, and they, this was a 12-week intervention where these participants received, I would say, a fair amount of uh, a sweet beverage, namely uh, 1.25 or up to 1.75 liters. And the beverage was sweetened with sucrose, aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, or uh, rep A. So the stevia uh, side. Uh, and they had some intriguing findings. Uh, interestingly, they see that if you look at the change in body weight, that saccharin shows a similar increase in body weight as sucrose. And saccharin is very often used in, in rodent studies. Um, so I think that's of interest because in most human studies, at least we have never used saccharin. Sucralose, uh, on the other hand, is showing an effect in the other direction tends towards weight loss, and it's significantly different from uh, sucrose. And also, if you look at energy intake, uh, obviously energy intake is higher if you have sucrose in your drink. That makes sense. Uh, saccharin is, well, going in the direction that you would expect based on this. Uh, and again, uh, but sucrose shows a small but significant decline in energy intake. So this is summarizing the results of this paper. So for sucrose and saccharin, there is a similar uh, increase in BMI. And it doesn't change in line with also with the, the meta-analysis I just showed uh, for the other sweeteners. Although there is a, a slight change for sucralose uh, well, in the good direction. Um, and they also looked at the glucose tolerance, which might be of interest to you. And there they saw uh, no effect of any of the sweeteners given, which I would say is good news. So uh, to wrap up, uh, I think I've shown that the simple cephalic phase insulin narrative uh, causing uh, overconsumption uh, does not hold. The data is just not there. To begin with, this response is not a robust uh, thing. Uh, and well, the meta-analysis showed that also the intake is not uh, increased. There's ongoing work uh, about the physiological effects of the mismatch between sweetness and caloric content. I think there is still uh, some controversy, not just the work we are trying to replicate. There's another paper from the Yale group, uh, Jelle Dahlenberg, uh, it's a preprint, so it's not uh, peer reviewed yet. But they suggest that if sucralose, if a drink is just sweetened with sucralose but has no calories, that then you're basically okay. But if there is some carbohydrate in this drink, I suppose it's a mismatch, uh, then you see uh, neural and metabolic effects. So I think this is uh, well at the heart of the, well, of the debate. And so we will, we will have to see the data and also the replication of those data uh, in the future. Uh, and then I think, yeah, I was also struck by this notion, by this paper. It made me very aware that these sweeteners are not the same compounds and so that we cannot assume that they have similar effects. It's not just sweetness. It can be a lot of other things as well. So this uh, concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention and I thank my collaborators. <laughs>